With your Bible open to two places this morning, Revelation chapter number 6, I want to begin there, and then also in Matthew's gospel chapter number 24. I will limit my time this morning because I don't expect to thoroughly cover some of the ground that I want to deal with this morning, but uh, I don't want to just rush over it either. But uh, Revelation chapter 6 and uh, Matthew chapter number 24, those will be our text, the Lord willing, uh, this morning. Now let me say just a couple of things about the end times. Last week I preached on the rapture, then what? What's going to happen? And I used that opportunity to talk about Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And uh, I believe that the church is pictured as being raptured. Now you will not find the word rapture in your Bible. But a catching away, we certainly find several of those in the, in the Bible. And uh, that is the blessed hope of the church. If the church did not have the uh, hope, the expectation that Jesus Christ was going to come again, where would that leave us? Many of the things that Paul talked about that is associated with the resurrection could never be fulfilled. Uh, what about those who have died in Christ? If there's no resurrection, they're perished. If Christ did not rise from the grave, we're still in our sins. And our faith is made void. The resurrection is very... Matter of fact, without the resurrection of Jesus, you do not have Christianity. And so we talked about uh, the rapture last week and what would happen. Of course, uh, the dead saints will rise... They will uh, be raised at the time of Christ's second coming. And the living saints, of course, will be translated. They'll be changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. Now, that's the blessed hope of the church. And I'm glad that I have that. Now, I personally believe that the rapture will take place, the catching away of the true church. And then tribulation period will begin on this earth. We talked a little bit last week about... If you put the rapture in Revelation chapter 4, then chapter 4 and 5 is a scene that takes place in heaven. And uh, there will be rejoicing. The church will be praising Christ as creator in chapter 3. They'll be praising him as their redeemer in chapter uh, number 5. But here in Revelation chapter 6, we find the beginning of the tribulation period. And I think that the next 12 chapters in the book of the Revelation are laid out very clearly and plainly. And uh, I have a good friend, one of my best friends, and we disagree about when the rapture of the church will take place. And uh, we debate that vigorously, and we are the best of friends. And, uh, but I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That is the hope of the church. God has not appointed us under uh, wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. By His coming in the clouds, and the church is called out to meet the Lord. So we talked a little bit last week, and we looked at it from the standpoint of the church. And we talked about Revelation 4 and 5, after the rapture of the church, what's going to take place. We mentioned the judgment seat of Christ, and we mentioned the marriage supper of the Lamb. And today, here in Revelation chapter 6, I want to begin reading with verse 1. Read quickly down through verse number 8. I want to speak to you today on the subject of the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 1 says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword." And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for uh, a penny. 
And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Here, I think, marks the beginning of what is said in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse number 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. And I want to say more about that in just a little bit. Now, we're living in perilous days, no doubt about that. I believe we're living in the day shortly before the Lord's coming for His church. There's a lot of people that are seeing the things that are going on. With the pandemic, our whole way of life has been upset and turned upside down. Seems like there's political upheaval in our country. But I would call your attention to the fact that all around the world there is no rest, there is no peace, and the world is desperately seeking for it. There's a lot of people that seem to almost be losing their grip on reality. I mean, listen, folks, we're going to have to trust God during these days. Get a grip and do not ever lose your faith in what the Word of God has to say. The Bible has predicted that things would get worse and worse, and we're now living in those days, but God has not forsaken us. He has not abandoned us, nor will He ever. That makes the blessed hope of the church a blessed hope, the anticipation that Christ can come at any moment and deliver us from this. But I would also say that this world is headed for a time of trouble and tribulation, the likes of which the Bible says that there has never been in the history of the world, nor ever shall be again. And we refer to that time as the tribulation period, or as the Bible says, the time of Jacob's trouble. Now I want to emphasize the time of Jacob's trouble for just a little bit. Now stand back with me, and I want to be as brief with this and as concise as I possibly can. Stand back for a moment and look back through the history of our Bible. Uh, from the days of Adam up until the call of Abraham, humanity was in one stream. They were all Gentiles. There was no division between Jews and Gentiles. It was only Gentiles. But God began to do a wonderful thing in uh, Genesis chapter number 12. He called Abraham. Now, Abraham was a pagan man living in the Ur of the Chaldees. And God, in grace and mercy, appeared unto Abraham. And he began with Abraham and created a new nation. It was the nation of Israel. Israel as a nation can trace their founding all the way back. And Abraham was a patriarch of the family. So in the days of Abraham, God separated Abraham and began to deal exclusively with Abraham and his offspring. Now think about it like this. There's a fork in the river of the stream of humanity in Genesis chapter 12. The Gentiles continue on their way. They're living under the, uh, they have their conscience and uh, they have human government which was established by God to be the rule and the authority over the Gentile worlds. But God began with Abraham and started with him a new era of promise. It was to Abraham and to his seed. So throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the Bible is taken up dealing with the nation of Israel. Now other Gentiles, individuals, and nations are only mentioned as they come in contact with the nation of Israel. And uh, remember, uh, the Gentile world had so become so corrupt in Noah's day that God sent a flood and destroyed everyone except for Noah and his family. God established with Noah and his family human government. There was a man that came on the scene that took advantage of that. His name was Nimrod. He became the first world dictator and a religious ruler as well. They built that tower whose top may reach under the heavens or literally be likened to heavens. And instead of worshiping the God of creation and the God of glory, they changed the God of glory, that truth of him, into 
images like to beast and four-footed things and creeping things that the Bible describes in Romans chapter number 1. So we could say that the Gentile world apostatized, but God separated the nation of Israel, chose them through Abraham to call a peculiar people unto himself. So the rest of the Old Testament history is taken up primarily with the nation of Israel. Now individuals like Rahab the harlot, like Ruth the Moabitess, as they come in contact with Israel and with the God of Israel and accepted him, then of course they became part of the family of God. They were Jewish proselytes, we might say. And all the way down through even the New Testament, when you read the Gospels, who did Jesus come he came to his own nation, the Jewish people. And they rejected him and crucified the Lord of glory. They rejected God the Son. And when that happened, God judicially blinded them. As a matter of fact, I think in the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, the kingdom of God is still being offered to the Jews uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51... When the Jewish religious leaders resisted the preaching of Stephen, which was done by the power of the Holy Ghost, they literally blasphemed. The word resisted in Acts 7, 51 is the word blasphemed. And when they did that, that sealed their doom as a nation. They had rejected God the Father in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In the Gospels, they rejected God the Son and crucified Him. And then in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, they stopped up their ears and they stoned the servant of God as he preached under the anointing of the Spirit of God. And when they did that, God judicially blinded the nation of Israel. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 11 that blindness in part is happened unto Israel. And so uh, God cut them off, judicially blinded them. And uh, God began to do a new thing. We call this the age of grace. Uh, God began to deal with individuals. Now we preach the gospel of the grace of God. We preach it to individual people. And individually people get saved. And God has not dealt with a nation like he did the nation of Israel since he cut Israel off. Now let me hasten to say this. Don't tune me out right here. That does not mean that God is finished with the nation of Israel. The very scripture that I read here in Revelation chapter number 1, I think is when God again picks up and begins to deal with the nation of Israel during the tribulation period. The tribulation period will serve to get Israel ready for their Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who will come in His second advent, power and great glory in Revelation chapter number 19. But you cannot deny that this is the time of Jacob's trouble referring to the nation of Israel that we find throughout the book of the Revelation beginning in chapter 6 and running all the way down through chapter number 18. Israel again comes to the forefront. The church which has been raptured in chapter number 4 is not mentioned from chapter 4 to the 19th chapter of the book of the Revelation. They will be the armies which mount white horses and return in the second advent. Uh, that's who Jesus is going to bring back with him to the earth to set up his kingdom at that time. Now, I know I've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time there. Let's look at our text here, Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 1. I saw the lamb, uh, or I saw... Uh, when the Lamb opened one of the seals and heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now here begins what we call the seven seal judgments of God. And notice in verse number two, if you will, I beheld a white horse and him that sat on it had a bow. Now here we are introduced to a white horse. This is the revelation of the Antichrist on the earth. In chapter number 19, Christ himself mounts a white horse to return to this earth. So in mockery and in a counterfeit way, here is the Antichrist coming. The church is in heaven, chapter 5 and 6. 
the tribulation period, the time of Jacob's trouble begins here on the earth. A notice, if you will, he had a bow but no arrows. The message of the Antichrist will be peace and safety. He'll have the bow but no arrows. A crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. I think that the world will laud and applaud and approve of the coming of the Antichrist. They will crown him as their superman. They will say, this man has the answer to our problems. He will come in peaceably. Daniel said that he would conquer by flatteries. And here he is, he went forth conquering and to conquer. That is the first seal of the judgment of God. A false Christ comes on the scene. Later, we read about this false Christ in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8. And all the world will worship him. He'll seek governmental control and control of commerce and politically and economically for seven years he's going to control on this earth. Now notice, if you will, when the second seal was opened in verse number 3, uh, the Bible says there went another horse that was red. This represents bloodshed. Power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. You know, we're living in a world that has very little peace today. If I looked at outward circumstances, I would be troubled, troubled, troubled by what I see. But I want to tell you something. My faith is not in this world or the world system or in politicians. I have an inward peace because I know the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. And so uh, I think that's the way that I am trying to retain what little sanity I have left is that inward peace. Boy, Christ lives in my heart. And uh, so, but during the tribulation period, peace is going to be taken from the earth. Isn't it sad that all the World organizations are calling for peace constantly, and there is no peace. I'll tell you how peace comes. It comes through a knowledge of who Jesus is. Peace comes because the Holy Spirit restrains and holds back evil in our world. Peace comes from the Word of God that we read and feel that in our soul, that this book is true. That's where peace comes from. But in the tribulation period, that will be gone. And notice... They'll kill one another in verse number 4. And there was given unto him a great sword. When I read the words a great sword, I wonder about what that is. Used to be the first thing that I would think about was atomic bomb. And certainly that is a great weapon of mass destruction. But what about the pandemic? What about some of the biological warfare that's going on? I don't know exactly what this great sword will be, but with it, Many people will die according to the later verses. As a matter of fact, if you look at these verses that's found here, uh, because it says in verse number 5, there was a black horse. And uh, the scripture says in uh, verse, number, uh, verse number 5 that he had a pair of balances. The rider of the black horse had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the beast saying, A measure of wheat for a penny and a measure of barley uh, for a penny. See that you hurt not the oil and the wine. And no doubt that speaks of a time maybe uh, a famine upon this earth. And uh, then later in verse number 8, and I don't have time to, uh, de to say a great deal about this, but the pale horse comes, and death and hell followed and with him a power was given unto them that a fourth part of the earth will be killed with the sword, with hunger and with death and the beast of the earth. So there is coming a time of great bloodshed. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. Now let me again emphasize that I think during the tribulation period, God again begins to deal with the nation of Israel which he has temporarily set aside. God has not cast away his people Israel, which he foreknew. Paul reiterates that. He will again deal with them. There's a lot of folks that have the idea that since Israel crucified their Messiah and rejected the Holy Ghost, that God's thrown them away and he's done with them. That is not according to the Bible. I think in the book of the Revelation, during the tribulation, he again begins to deal with him. 
very quickly, and I'm only going to take about seven more minutes. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 24, Jesus went out of the temple under the Mount of Olives, and His disciples came to show Him the buildings of the temple. So Jesus goes over the Mount of Olives with His disciples while He's still here on earth, and they had a great view of the temple. And the disciples, they were very pleased with that. They thought that Jesus would set up his kingdom at that time. It appears that everything was ready and right. And I think it was, with the exception of the hearts of the people of Israel. Uh, The temple had been rebuilt and refurbished. Had they accepted him as their Christ and as their Messiah, been awful easy for Jesus to walk triumphantly into that temple and begin at that time his millennial reign on the earth. But that was not to happen. Israel would reject their Messiah. Jesus said unto them in verse number 2, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It's almost as if he takes out a little pen and bursts their balloon in their bubble. Uh, They were so proud of those buildings. But Jesus said these Stones are going to be thrown down. There will not be left one upon the other. That was literally fulfilled in 70 A.D. And by the way, 70 A.D. was not the tribulation period. It is yet to come. Notice what Jesus says in verse number 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. Now these are Jewish disciples. They know nothing about the church age. So they came to him, tell us, when shall these things be? You said everything was going to be thrown down. When is it going to be? Second question, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And listen, there are no signs for the rapture of the church. They're they're, They're thinking about his coming in power and great glory. They're Jewish disciples. And notice, and the end of the world. Now the word world, the little Greek word, It's the word aion. So three questions. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what will be the end of the age? What is it going to look like? They were talking about the Jewish age. Now in the next verses, he tells them what it's going to be like Jesus does in the tribulation. If you get the church and try to fit the church Into Matthew 24, verses 1 to 44, you're going to have some major problems. These are Jewish in nature, and Jesus begins to answer their question in verse number 4. He said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, notice this, I am Christ. That relates to Revelation 6 and verse number 2 that I mentioned to you a while ago the rider of the white horse. They'll come and say, I am Christ. They'll deceive many. And notice, ye shall see wars and rumors of war. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 4, the great weapons that it talked about. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end. Now, if you mark in your Bible, underline the word, the end. You'll see that two more times in this passage that I'm going to read. The end there refers to the age that those disciples were talking about, which was the Jewish age that will be fulfilled during the tribulation. Uh, The end is not yet. We could say the end of the tribulation is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, and that relates to Revelation chapter 6, verse 5 and 6 that I read just a moment ago. There will be famines and pestilences. Now the word pestilence refers to an oriental plague. And that is not hard for us to imagine right now, is it? Plagues that come on the earth. And notice earthquakes in diverse places. Those are all signs of the second advent. There are no signs given for the rapture of the church. So these things are going to be fulfilled in a future day. Jesus is talking to his disciples. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse number 8. Then shall they deliver you, you Jews, to be afflicted and shall kill you. 
and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The Jews have suffered immeasurably over the years, the two, to the two millennial since Christ went back into heaven. They have suffered under the hands of Gentile world rulers. If you go back just 70 years ago to a man by the name of Hitler who sent to the gas chamber over six and a half million Jews alone and brought death to 70 million people on the continent of Europe. But I got news for you, Israel is going to have a future holocaust as well. The likes of which the world has not seen by Hitler or Mussolini or any of the persecutions that they have endured over the years. God said that these times will come and they'll be hated of all nations. He said, for my name's sake. You want to wonder why the nations of the world are turning against Israel? That tiny little country of what significance are they? Well, geologically and, princip uh, and p politically, not much. But the reason that the nations of this world hate Israel and all nations, including the United States of America, will turn against Israel is this, that they are the producer of the Messiah, the Son of God. It is a spiritual hatred toward them, and that will increase during the tribulation time. Notice verse number 10. Many shall be offended and shall betray one another and offend one another and hate one another. During the tribulation period, many false prophets shall rise. Now, prophets were always sent to the nation of Israel. God gives teachers to the church, but prophets to the nation of Israel. Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many, that is, the Jews. And because iniquity shall abound during the tribulation period, the love of many shall wax cold. That is not just referring to a love of God, but that will be a love, a natural affection towards one another. Uh, there will be Jewish people that will be betrayed to the Antichrist for money uh, simply because there's, uh, I mean, natural love will not be as it is now. Peace is going to be taken from the earth. That is a spiritual phenomenon that will happen during the tribulation period. And notice, if you will, it says in verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, there's the word the end again, that is a reference again to the tribulation period. I think this is a promise to Jewish people that if they endure to the end of their life, during the time of Jacob's trouble, when Israel will be going through a holocaust and will be hunted and will be killed by the Antichrist, if you endure to the end of the tribulation period, here's a promise that as a remnant of people, you will be saved. They will live to see the second advent, the glorious appearing of their Messiah. Notice verse 14. And here's a verse, I think, that has a lot of people shaken up. And this place, this verse, and it's difficult to deal with. Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for a witness unto all nations, and then shall, notice this again, the end of the tribulation come. Now, take me to task if you will, but I believe this. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Now, there's a lot of people that have this idea that you know there's not really going to be a catching away of the church. There's not going to really be a rapture, and there's not really going to be a tribulation, but rather we're going to be preaching the gospel, and boy, you know, people, we're going to have a big revival, and everybody's going to get saved. Everybody's going to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when everybody accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Lord's going to look down from heaven and He's going to say, boy, they're doing great, everybody's saved. I believe I'll just go down and join them. Well, you're overlooking a whole lot of things that are described in prophecy. You're overlooking a lot of things. What about what the Apostle Paul, evil men and seducers would wax worse and worse? What about in the end times that they'd have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof? No, the current church age will end in apostasy of the professing church, religious people. 
The true church will be raptured and taken into heaven. The tribulation begins on the earth. And during the tribulation is when Jesus is talking in these verses. And I would call your attention to the fact that the church now does not preach the gospel of the kingdom. There are a lot of people trying to make this world a better place to live in. Listen, that's not the hope and the mission of the church. The church is to preach the gospel of the grace of God. God's calling out a Gentile bride for his name's sake. We're going to be called out. Instead of getting better, the world's going into tribulation, a time of Jacob's trouble. And notice it is the gospel of the kingdom, and it will be preached in all the world. Now, who's going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom? The 144,000 Jews of Revelation 17 and chapter number 14. And it'll be a witness unto all nations. Today, you and I, we witness and we preach not to nations but to individuals. We go into all nations of the world because we have a whosoever will gospel. If you'll believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, come repenting of your sins, you can be saved. That's the message of the church. But in the tribulation, the 144,000, they're going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They're going to say the same thing that John preached, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand or shortly to be revealed. And it will be. It says in the scripture here, and then shall the end come. In all three of these verses, verse 6, and then again uh, in verse number, what did I say? Verse number uh, 11 and verse, num or verse number 13 and verse number 14. The end there refers to the end of the tribulation period. And I say this, and I close because I've gone five minutes over my time. We are living in very exciting days. Exciting days. God has called us as believers, as a church, to preach the gospel to whosoever will. And I know that a lot of times that message is rejected, but that is our hope. We're trying to get ready for the appearing of Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, the head of the church, and then tribulation. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe the tribulation period will serve the same thing that Egyptian bondage served in Old Testament times. The Egyptian bondage was so fierce and so cruel that they began to pray to God. And God heard the cries of His people, the nation of Israel, and He raised up a deliverer, a man by the name of Moses, who came down and through miracles and powers and signs and wonders delivered the nation of Israel and led them out into the promised land. And I believe that the tribulation period will serve to ready Israel for the coming of the Son of God to be their Messiah. Our Father, I pray that as we have talked about this subject today, I know a lot of people, uh, there's things that, that I have said that's hard to understand. I pray the Holy Spirit will help them. There are other Bible students who would agree heartily that they know these truths. And then, Lord, there are others who would just take exception to it. I ask you to open their hearts and minds as well as we have sought to explain the Word of God. Our Father, we ask you that in these days as a church that we might see people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You have given us a whosoever will gospel, and we're to preach that to whomever we find. I ask you to bless that message. Help us as your people, Lord, to look up. You said these times were coming, and they're here, and we're excited about the prospect that Jesus may come today. There may be some listening and watching today that have never trusted you as Lord and Savior. I pray the Spirit of God would work in their hearts to help them realize that this world is judgment-bound. Heaven is sweet, hell is hot, and eternity is long. Help them to be prepared. And our Father will give you glory for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.